Good Tuesday morning, folks. Welcome to the podcast daily. I am Jeremy Birmingham. That is Bill Landis. We are continuing our little week of, uh, you know, switcheroo uh, that Austin and I are, are, are flipping days this week. It's actually nice, Bill, because we weren't planning on getting into this little rhythm, but it seems like Monday is me and you. Tuesday is you and Austin. Wednesday is the three of us. Uh, you know, Thursday is Austin and myself. And then uh, Friday is the three of us. So I, I like that. Um, and I know that we had to f- flip around, play a little, you know, this is a true life freaky Friday, uh, as <laughs> you know, with giving proper homage to the, to the classic film of the same name, but today's Tuesday, we'll call it uh terrible Tuesday. It's, is it, is it a classic film? Is that what we're calling freaky Friday? <laughs> would you not? I mean, between that and 13 going on 30 is two of the classic films of the 21st century. I am O. I am you say H-O. so. I mean, you know, I am H O for sure. Um, Tuesday, Bill, uh, as as is normal, we're going to talk about the things that we would like to get answered or um, try to get answered from Ohio State's availability. Uh, the press conference that happens at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center that will start at twelve o'clock noon. You can find that live on the podcast YouTube channel. Uh, this week, we're going to get Ryan Day, we're going to get Jim Knowles, and we're going to get Tony Alford, so a trio of coaches to break down what's going on in and around the Buckeyes program. No no players until Wednesday night. I'll let you start with the first question or first concern or query that you'll have for, for the guys on Tuesday. What is it that you're dying to know? Well, usually when we do this show, we always start with injury. So bypassing that, although it's important. We don't have to. to. Be asked, it needs, well, I'm just, I'm just tired of starting the show <laughs> Every yeah, let's finish show the show with injuries. With injury stuff. Um, I am interested in um, kind of picking Ryan Day's brain a little bit on uh, red zone play calling and this idea that I don't think is totally unfounded. In fact, it's probably even true, and I'm not even sure it's a bad thing, that he was trying to get CJ uh, some stats in that game against Rutgers by throwing the ball as often as they did in the red zone in that game. I, I looked this up beforehand because I wanted to make sure I, I had it right. So in that game, the first team offense ran 46 plays. Uh, 23 of them were called runs. So it was 50-50 throughout the entire game. Inside the 10-yard line, they ran 18 plays. or Yeah, 18 plays or 19 plays. And it was, again, 50-50 pass and run, which is like kind of crazy. That's a lot of passes to call inside the 10-yard line. That um, is, but, but it's also crazy to think that, uh, what, just about a third of their plays, more than a third of their plays as the starters were from inside the 10 yard line. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, well, that that includes that number inside the 10 also includes the plays that technically didn't count, the ones that were called back for penalties. But I just wanted to see how many times Ryan Day called a pass inside the 10 yard line. Um, and it was half the time they lined up in there. Uh, but I, I don't think it's wrong of him to maybe force the issue a little bit and try to get C.J. Stroud an extra touchdown or two. Uh, and I'm interested in your viewpoint on that, too, because in my mind, like C.J. is very much in the Heisman Trophy race. These are the kind of games where you sort of pad the stats and then it's the big time games where everyone's watching where you actually kind of win the award. But until those games come, you just need to keep racking up the stats. And C.J.'s in perfect position statistically to win the Heisman Trophy. I still think he's the favorite, even though some other people don't. But what do you make of the idea that that Ryan Day was trying to pad CJ stats in that game with the way he called it. Uh, I think there's probably something to it. I think it's one of the things on Ryan Day's own resume that he doesn't have yet, which is a Heisman Trophy winner. Uh, and that's something that, you know, Lincoln Riley uses to great success on the recruiting trail. And he was able to put a couple of those guys together. Um, uh, my question would be not why are you throwing it so much there? Because actually, if you go back through the season and you think about the red zone offense, which has been uh, successful at, at a much ra- greater rate than it was a year ago as far as scoring touchdowns. There does seem to be this challenge uh, of throwing the ball down there that I haven't really seen. We've seen a couple break open plays like the Cade Stover one last week and that, but it seems like they're, you know, people are kind of packing them in a little bit and trying to force CJ to make those throws. And I'm wondering why they keep rolling him out in those situations mm-hmm. and, and eliminating half of the field essentially for him to work with because in my my vantage point is that cj's best attribute is his ability to see the field and i I think cutting it in half is helping the defense but uh no i I think there's probably something to that 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 he's looking at it and saying hey this these are the games to to pad stats and the truth is i think most people objectively speaking would look at the numbers that cj's put up this season and say oh those are pretty good but not what we would have 
thought heading into the season because we weren't sure what to expect um, with the running game. And, you know, obviously people would have anticipated having Jackson out there for all these games to help make it more comfortable. But I don't think the numbers have been like egregious or, or crazy so far. So I think you need a couple extra t- TDs in, in the old uh, score column. Yeah, I think I think so, too. I, I don't have any issue with it whatsoever. It's more I guess I'm I'm wondering more about um, the motivation behind some of it than anything, because I, I, I think you need to be able to throw it in the red zone and. It's been a little hit or miss for Ohio State, I think, throughout Ryan Day's tenure, their their ability to do that. It, it was trending in a pretty good direction before this game, I think. I actually wrote about that um, last week that CJ had improved his pass, passing, at least a completion percentage um, in the red zone by, I think, like five or six percentage points. So it was, was a fairly substantial increase. Uh, but I'm sure that's dropped down now after this game where um, – he had some incompletions too, but also they just like they kept grabbing Marvin Harrison Jr. like getting defensive pass interference penalty. So like it wasn't all that it was the a clunky passing game. I think some opportunities to score were probably taken away from them by yeah. uh, by Rutgers penalties. But that probably adds to the frustration. I, I I would imagine that when that happens, it makes you want to throw it even more down there. Uh, it was certainly frustrating to be sitting there uh, in the back of that end zone for about eighteen minutes uh, straight mm-hmm. on Saturday afternoon, going, "Is this drive ever going to end?" Uh, if you know, speaking about the one in particular, I have a question that I'd like to get sort of some uh, input slash analyses on. If you look back, if you remember, um, Ohio State was at Northwestern in 2019. They were up like 49 to nothing or something like that. And Ryan Day decided to kick a 56 yard field goal or something with Blake Howell mm-hmm. for no reason at all, other than to say we're going to need to probably do this at some point, and just to kind of give Blake the chance to do that and hit it. And I was kind of annoyed that they didn't kick a field goal um, with the wind at their back in the fourth quarter against uh, Rutgers because there was a perfect opportunity to get Noah Ruggles out there and hit one from, I think it was like 55 yards out. And I think he should have just done it because you're going to need to kick a field goal at some point to win a game this year. And I get like, like we've for the first four games done this thing where we've watched them punt and successfully over and over and over drop the ball inside of the five yard line so like that part's good you know like that part's clear uh i I think you need to to test noah ruggles a little bit and i would like to know what the logic was there if it was like hey if this was a closer game would you have tried a field goal because i think you're going to need to kick a field goal at penn state or uh, against michigan or somewhere along the road uh to winning a national championship and you know they've kicked a couple this year but none of them have really mattered and uh, and the one you know the one that did matter objectively the most in the entire season, at the end of the first half against Notre Dame was a twenty eight yarder that was missed. And so like I'm like mm, I'd like to see. I know it sounds like a, a nitpicky thing, but again, as we've said before, like this is something we have to do when your team is playing it at the level they're playing. It. <laughs> it, it's funny that you say that because when I was thinking about uh, bold predictions coming into last week, I almost predicted like a fifty five yard field goal for Noah Ruggles. I think his career long is fifty one. Uh, at UNC, um, but I kind of agree with you. I, I am curious what his range is. Um, I'm not. I'm not really worried about his ability to hit field goals in high leverage situations because he won basically two games for them last year. Three, I guess, if you include the Rose Bowl. Um, so, so I, I think do you can handle the Rose Bowl. It. Yeah, I think you should include the Rose Bowl. Um, I so I think he can do it, but doing it from from a distance is is another thing. So yeah, I guess it would have been cool to, to to see him do that. I can't say it's a it's a pressing question of mine going yeah, into this week. I but just I just back, feel like not? you don't know when you're going to get that opportunity again to try yeah. that. And at a point in the game where it's forty nine to ten, you you were doing the right thing by not throwing to the end zone after the Shiano scuffle, but like you could have tried to kick a field goal in that situation instead, and it wouldn't have been like over the top or. or or disrespectful i think at that point if you're try trotting it out there for a 55 yard or just to kind of see what the guy can do um you know again i, I know it's nitpicky but it's something that like since saturday and since rewatching it i'm like i feel like they should have done it because i know specifically that that game against northwestern they were up seven touchdowns and we're like you know what let's just try it and see if we can make it and it do you-, you know turned out important that year do you think so? Like this one that happened last week, obviously because it was his first game being eligible. But let's say, like, f- I don't know, five weeks from now, they're in a situation where they want to try a long field goal. Do you think it would be Noah Ruggles, where they give Parker Lewis the shot? Because the word on Parker Lewis, I guess, is that he has a big leg, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, is if if it's a close game and you're trying to kick a field goal to to win or tie, or if you're just trying to see how far a guy can kick it, because he's going to have two years left after this one. So I think it's a, it's situational, but certainly, you know, we had a a lot more conversation around Parker Lewis's uh you know potential play uh, playing amount this season pregame on Saturday than I would have anticipated. But you know, Austin <laughs> seems very um, dedicated to the fact that he's not going to play this year in red redshirt. Uh, but, you know, I, I also am dedicated to rewatching games on, on game g- game rewatch today. So we're all we're all committed to our own different things. And uh, Austin's Hill is is Parker Lewis can lose this season. We 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 rewatch the Rutgers game. Austin, yeah. Austin was not born in the mud like us. Burn. We, yeah, we, that's true. We, we like, we like he merely adopted dirty. it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another adopted question it. of mine that I have um, that probably a lot of people have is it's Denzel Burke related. So I suppose it could be for Ryan day. It could also be for Jim Knowles. Um, and it's something that Austin and I talked a little bit about on Monday. And it's like the, the accountability of this thing when, when a guy's not playing well and more specifically, like, I guess bluntly, why didn't Jair Brown play? How do they feel about him at the moment and his ability to play? Like if he, if he can start against Wisconsin, then why can't he play against Rutgers? I guess is is the way that I would frame it. When when a guy out there is struggling, and like I, the struggles don't matter. I understand that like Rutgers was no threat to Ohio State, but um, I also think there's part of it too where you want to send a message to your team where like if you're not playing well, we're not going to put you out there. And and they keep letting a guy who's not playing particularly well just kind of do it over and over again uh, to the point where I'm starting to get a little nervous about it when a game comes that does matter or that can be challenged. So. Um, I'm I'm wondering how they're how they're weighing that and why specifically Jair didn't get more of a shot in that game. Yeah, and I imagine the answer will be Jair could start against Wisconsin because Denzel couldn't, uh, and so I think that there's a a nice clean out in that conversation. Now the the follow up conversation of well, Denzel could play against Rutgers, but he still didn't play very well, and Jair pr- proved that he was good enough uh, in the Wisconsin game to earn more reps. Where did they go? Um, and that's, again, something I we talked about on Snap Judgments on Saturday night. Like, I don't know if this is a situation where Ohio State is is trying to tell him to just shoot his way out of the slump. I don't know if it's a situation where they just are so desperate uh, at corner to play guys. There is something that's not clicking for Denzel Burke. And, again, I, I've, we've talked about this over and over, and I don't want to keep – you know, I don't want to beat a dead horse because – and I don't want to pick on the kid, but like it, it seems like he's just mentally disconnected when the when the plays are happening. And, and I don't know if he's if it's something in the technique. I don't know if it's something in just what, what he's doing. But that was one of my big questions, not necessarily just even for Denzel Burke, because I think and to this point, Ohio State has avoided it. And I, and I think that Tony Alford is really good at avoiding these situations. But the drum beats are going to get louder and louder and louder for Mayan Williams to be the 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 featured back and for Travion Henderson when he's healthy I think that there's a lot of people that are going to think that he he should be the the clear-cut number two tailback and I I I wonder and this is for each coach how do you deal with these mental hurdles that you have to get over with players who are not performing to the level that not just the coaches expect but that the players expect because Travion has been pretty good this year, and I, I I keep saying that as well. Like he hasn't been bad; he's averaging over six yards a carry, but Mayan's averaging seven point seven yards a touch, and there's a the the clamoring is going to get louder. And if you bring in Trey and he doesn't hit a home run, I mean, how 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 do you deal with with the mental side of of this game for these kids that are so used to being absolutely unequivocally successful that if they're struggling, you know. What is the what is the um, responsibility of the coaching staff to say that's enough? We're we're good right now. Um, I think it's because those are the only two positions on the entire field for Ohio State where there is no depth really at all to consider mm-hmm. playing around with it. You know, it's not like you can take Travion and say, oh, "Okay, you're not going to play. We'll just play down all the time." If if Mayan gets hurt, Travion has to be the guy. Like if another corner gets hurt. Denzel Burke has to play better or you just can't bring somebody in. Right. So it is a, it is a big question. I, I don't know. I wish we could have gotten a little bit more into that with Tim Walton last Tuesday. 
Yeah, sometimes these these settings where they're up at the podium are not the best to really get in depth on that kind of stuff because you're sort of limited to to one or two questions. But but I do find running back interesting. Um, I I don't think like it's necessarily a problem. Like I I think maybe that's probably a few steps down the line here. And and I I was encouraged really by how Trevion ran the ran the last time we saw him against Wisconsin. And even at that time, I think there was a little bit of clamoring for Mayan just because Mayan, I think, it had been a little more consistent. And that didn't, at least in my opinion, didn't seem to get the Trevion very much. And and, and in fact, it seemed to, to fuel him to, to run a little uh, better and differently, I thought, yeah. against Wisconsin. So um, we didn't get to see it against Rutgers. Uh, and I don't know if we'll get to see it against Michigan State. That'll depend on, on Trevion's health and whether or not he's able to go this week. Uh, but even if he's not, and uh, Mayan plays well again this week. They go into the buy and then they come back for for the Iowa game, and both those guys are ready to go. Um, I I think they can handle it. I, I at least I'll say like that. I I trust Tony Alford's ability to handle it. Um, I don't I don't know that I would sort of intrinsically trust just any coach to to do that. But but I think Tony um, has the right relationships with these guys and, and knows how to press the right buttons to to make sure that it works out. If if we get to the point where maybe. Trevion's roles is a little different than, than what he anticipated, but I'm, I'm not totally sure we're there just yet. No, I, I think it's a situation where uh, I, I guess my curiosity is how much do you pay attention as a coach proactively to what is maybe coming from the fan base? You know, you're, you're telling these kids all the time, don't read the press clippings, good or bad. Don't pay attention to social media. And, and to this point, there hasn't been an overwhelming number of fans, you know, being, negative about Travion Henderson, but I think that what Mayan Williams has done is earned him rightfully more carries. And so any sort of disparity and or like leaning towards giving the ball to Trey when someone thinks Mayan should have it uh, is going to open up a door for this. You know, when you're a kid that's never had the fan base. um, Now, I don't want to say against you because I don't think that's fair, but when you when you've never been on the opposite, the opposing side of the the Ohio State fans who are insane in, in a good way i guess and, and a bad way sometimes it, it can be overwhelming and i so i just curious how they prepare for that one thing i want to know um in talking to jim knowles is what's the role for court williams i just i'm fascinated by this entire season and this entire experiment for him because again he's the guy out there at the coin toss he's a captain on this team and he's out there every special teams play and but then he's out there on the last drives of the game against Rutgers up 49 to 10. And I'm like, man, I, how, how soon is too soon to start having the conversation that you and I brought up after the Toledo game? Like, what is the right time to begin saying to, to court, hey, maybe if maybe your future here is at, at a different position? Or is there something else that we're not seeing that we're missing? Because I don't think clearly he's handled himself the, in a professional and, and correct way off the field and in the locker room and in the classroom and all that stuff. So like what, where's the disconnect and what, what, what do they see him doing in the, in the future? And again, maybe it's not the right time to ask that question, but that's what I'm like, man, it's weird to just see him out there at the end of the game when it's, it's really not where you thought he'd be. I I don't think it's a terrible time to ask that question. Um, You know, it's not like a huge game week. I don't think there's going to be a bunch of like in-depth Michigan state questions. Right. So um, I too am interested in that. And I, I don't know if Court is still battling some sort of injury thing. He made a play, it actually made him the last play of the game, mm-hmm. um, where he sort of like upended the running back and then was pretty slow to get up. Like it just it looked like making that play kind of took a lot out of him. Um, and he's played sparingly um, and, and just like far less than I think any of us had anticipated. And I suppose part of that is skill set and and what has emerged at the safety position, obviously, which which – leads to the the linebacker questions um but i too wonder if part of it is maybe he's just not 100 percent, or, or or at least close enough to 100 percent to truly push for meaningful snaps uh, maybe yeah, he's just i, I have a tough time to buying that he's not 100 percent because he's out there on every special teams rep so i think that they're willing yeah. to let him go out there and, and knock his and knock people around so is it simply a matter of the body type isn't what they want out of that other court out of that other safety spot because they seemed comfortable bringing when when late or when Tanner McAllister went down or you know what second quarter of the game on on Saturday against Rutgers it was Kai Stokes who went in the game it was not uh Court Williams and you know I get it Rutgers isn't gonna pound the ball maybe if you know, I'd like to say, well, maybe in a different situation it wouldn't be that way but the week before it was Sonny Styles in the game early and often mm-hmm. not 
uh, Court Williams in, in a game against Wisconsin where you knew they'd be trying to run the ball and, and you need more of a heavy defense. So, like, I just don't – there's all these areas where you can point to and go, well, in this case, it probably should have been Court, but then it wasn't. So it's a little bit perplexing. It is. Um, I, I do think Jim Knowles is probably um, – honest enough in media settings. He, I don't think he knows any better yet. But so so I think he'll if you ask him that, I think he would actually shed some light on on conversations he's had with court, if any, about potentially making move or, or what his positional future is in this defense. Um another question I'd have for Jim Knowles is something you and I I think have talked about kind of on on the podcast and just sort of when we're talking about the team that we're not recording the conversations. Um and it's the idea of of whether or not Ohio State is getting enough sacks specifically i think less less so pressure on the quarterback because i think that's that's pretty obvious that they are but they have 10 sacks they played five games um that's not a particularly high number but they've also i was looking this up because somebody asked about it on on the board over at ohio state that rivals.com and ohio state has only faced 124 passing attempts this year which is um third fewest in the power five and fewest in the big 10 so they're they're not getting a lot of pass rush reps, but still like two per game is is a fairly low number. Um, and I wonder if if Jim Knowles thinks that as well, or if he kind of considers it like the turnover stuff we were talking about before, with like they'll they'll come as guys get more and more comfortable in this defense. Yeah, and that that is a surprising number, but I mean, I guess if you look at the offenses they played, it has not been any team that is particularly pass heavy. And that's what we've been talking about uh, the last three weeks. Like you don't know if you're going to run into that this season. Um, and if you don't, then maybe that potential weakness doesn't matter at corner. Um, but at some point uh, it, it could be, it could rear its ugly head. The last thing I'd want to know is on the defensive line. Like we saw the Zach Harrison on the interior of the defensive line and he was very effective, very efficient very Im- uh, impactful and disrupt- disruptive. You wrote about it at Dot in the Eyes on the OhioState.Rivals.com message board slash website. And I want to know who decides that. Is that all Larry Johnson? Is he the one saying, we're going to we're gonna move these guys around? Because like, I looked out there a few times on Saturday and saw Michael Hall lined up at the edge. I'm like, that, that's unusual. That's unexpected. And I'm just curious why they think, like, I, I get having those four out there together, uh, Michael Hall and, and Zach Harrison and, and Jack Sawyer and JT Duomaloa. I want to know like what goes into aligning them the way they were aligned because you yeah. figure that you just let the guys play the position that they normally play. But at the same time, it seems pretty effective. So I don't know anything yeah. about that. So I think it's just interesting. It is. That's like where I wish we had more time to just like do like a half hour sit down with each coach and be like, okay, can you tell me this? Because I'm an idiot. Well, that sounds like uh, some quality off-season content on the podcast that we can get into at some point. I, I agree, and I, I look forward to to doing more of a deep dive into all the reasons I'm an idiot. Um, but we can certainly <laughs> we can certainly delve into that. I can just bring my wife on, and uh, she can help uh, sort up sort that out for people. Um, uh, any other questions, Bill? That you you're dying to get answered on Tuesday afternoon at the Woody Hayes Athletic Center uh no we're all good we got our parking situation figured out for michigan state so we're ready to, we're ready to roll fantastic that was like the biggest question we needed to ask on tuesday <laughs> like where the hell is our parking pass but thank you michigan state for your um courteous response and your willingness to work with us and all of the ohio state media traveling to your beautiful stadium this weekend for bill landis i'm jeremy birmingham this is the podcast daily check back around noon as i said ohio state will be uh speaking at the podium at the woody hayes athletic center we'll carry it live we'll see you then See ya.